um, we have everybody on mute. Um, so if you do have questions, please pop them into the chat and we will try to cover them throughout uh, the conversation. And um, yeah, it should be a really good one. I have a, I have a number of questions that I'm eager to ask Sean about. So I'm Jen Fine and I'm co-founder and CEO of You Live to Travel and we're the creators of Yuli, which is the platform that makes group travel easy. And uh, we are not insurance experts, we are software experts, which is why we asked Sean to join us today. So Sean Bemrose from uh, Tony Bemrose uh, Insurance Brokers in Queensland. Thanks, Jen, and then thanks for the chance to have a chat to, to everyone. Um, I actually got uh, referred on to Jen by one of my clients who's, who's a, a tour operator, uh, adventure guide, uh, to have a chat and then to share some thoughts about where insurance is at the moment in this difficult and different world. Um, as a general overview for me, and, and, and with a caveat for my general disclaimer for being an insurance broker and giving this advice, this is all general advice only if you need personal advice or particular advice and you need to contact me directly, etc. Um, I'm a, a, um, the Managing Director of Tony Bemrose Insurance Brokers here in uh, Queensland. It's a general insurance broking firm, so we basically can place and underwrite all insurance uh, that you can think of, uh, from liability to property to professional indemnity, pretty much anything you, that can, you can buy insurance for, we, we can negotiate and manage. Um, as brokers, we work for the clients and not the insurance companies. So I'll deal with maybe a couple hundred different insurance companies or placement areas. And brokers traditionally, as their license says, we work for the client, which means that um, it's in, we act as you. So if we have a claim, brokers will also act as if it's you um, and be advocates as a general rule. Um, we are based in Queensland, as Jen said. Um, we're a licensed Australian insurance broking house, TV, Tony Bamrose Insurance Brokers, or TBIB. Uh, started in 1979. We're a family business, and I've got about 16 staff here. Um, and so we place business all throughout Australia and potentially for business uh, exposures for our clients who operate out of Australia but might visit internationally to do work uh, where we can do it. Um, I think that's pretty a, a rough introduction for me happy yeah, to visit perfect. me at, at www.tbib.com.au um, and as I said Jim will post my details afterwards if you've got any further questions exactly yeah so I think you know one of the things that we were talking about at the beginning was just really understanding kind of what's the current insurance landscape mm -hmm. with a particular focus on the travel yeah. uh, business and industry okay so look over the last maybe two to three years insurance has been general rule be getting progressively a little bit harder and more difficult certainly stuff that is not vanilla it's becoming a little more uh, challenging to get cover for um, we're finding a general feeling in the insurance market of they're becoming a little bit more risk adverse than they have been i think that's been contributed to um, underwriting losses general global events catastrophe events changes in law etc so insurers when they're not bringing in enough premium income to cover those losses and combined with the fact that they're not making much money at all in the investment markets now means that the insurance premiums get hit and, and appetite changes um, and i think that's a general rule particularly in the liability space there's been a lot more concentration in risk management and what are the the insureds doing to mitigate risk or to present themselves as as a well-organized um, business that I guess is conscious of, of the exposures that business might have. So insurance should always be seen as sort of a, a, a last resort for want of a better word, mm -hmm. but certainly something that will stand behind your business to keep you going should the worst happen. Um, but there's certainly a trend to, to, for, much more information to be gathered by the insurers to help them make decisions. And so when you say um, much more information being asked, so that's like if you're a travel business who's, who's looking to, let's say, you know, you've sort of paused your insurance and you're coming back in and looking to operate for 2021 and you need to renew or get a new policy, 
they're going to ask you a lot more questions than maybe they had asked you last yeah, year. Yeah, I think, I think exactly right. I think previously they might have just asked, okay, what's your expected business income? Where are you traveling to? Maybe how many participants you've had and probably not much more. Um, I was speaking to an a insurance company underwriter who basically said that, yes, they'll ask that question, those questions, obviously, to try and get an understanding of the size of your business, but they'll go further now to ask in probably a greater detail, what's your risk management? Um, if you're doing a, a journey overseas, do you have a plan in place that identifies maybe exposures or the type of guests you're taking with you, mm -hmm. um, whether or not you... Uh, have got a certain level of experience, they're certainly going to be asking that question more and more. Um, and to try and gauge uh, an understanding that you've actually thought through the risks as a, as a prudent business owner and operator, it's like it's all, as soon as you take money from someone to do something, you have a liability for it. Um, and that's the, the general feeling that's coming through. So certainly for trips that are considered more adventurous, then obviously the, the requirements are going to go up significantly. And so this is, I mean, previously they would have expected some kind of like risk management um, planning. Yeah. Any travel business, I'm assuming there would have been that expectation that you have some kind of, what happens if someone breaks their leg while they're on a trip? That's right. Them, right, kind of thing. And so this is just kind of um, making sure that you have a, a COVID section in there, I guess. and. One of my questions on that is, do you think that they're going to be requiring um, travel companies to require travel insurance? So like um, to mitigate their liability, pass that liability through to the traveler? Look, I think that's entirely possible. And I think that would be a, if, if I was an underwriter in an insurance company providing cover for your risk, um, and obviously one of the most obvious risks with a touring party is someone getting sick or injured, which is going to, re which is potentially a significant amount of money to be mm -hmm. paid for. Um, I can see no reason why they generally probably wouldn't ask that question to say, are your travellers taking their own travel insurance? At the very least, they they can see that as a a risk mitigation type strategy, mm -hmm. and uh, obviously that would minimise their risk for someone coming back to sue you, which is in the the obviously what no one wants to happen. But what's what liability insurance is all about. And so if you, if you make the decision as a travel business to require your travelers to purchase travel insurance, um, how do they make that recommendation without sort of looking like they're giving an, an insurance advice? Like how do they yeah. make sure they get the right cover without... Um, Look, uh, I think you'd have to be very cautious. And I think that concept of, of giving advice or insurance advice naturally, and like everyone I'm sure conscious of now, is that The law says that you are obviously have a duty of care to your traveller, um, but the law in Australia certainly uh, res uh, restrict those who can professionally give insurance advice or financial advice, financial planning advice, a whole bunch of stuff, um, which is generally why as insurance brokers are licensed to give advice uh, and we are covered for our advice with our own insurance policies. Um, Travel is in that area where I think it is a, um, obviously you can provide general recommendations. You can provide a level of risk management advice to your travelers. You can probably provide documents saying, we think you should have travel insurance because it will meet these major exposures. Mm -hmm. However, this advice is taken as general only and, and you must seek your own independent coverage from an insurance broker or an insurance company and make that decision on your behalf. Um, uh, so when you do say it is required think, that you purchase travel insurance, we recommend this level of cover for these reasons. However, you must ultimately make this decision on your own with your own advice. Let's well, absolutely. I think you, I don't think that's anything more than you can state fact. Mm -hmm. So that is a fact. You know, you need to have travel insurance because if you get injured overseas, then someone's going to have to pay the bill. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's a fact. So that's. I don't think that's a necessarily going to be qualified as giving any level of personal advice. That is a generic statement you can you can give to people. I think there's also, I think for the sake of you accepting their money, you are as a business are quite entitled to put some caveats around it. And one of those caveats may well be to participate in this trek, you will have to demonstrate that you're medically fit, mm -hmm. um, that you are aware of 
the circumstances and the style of, of journey you're going in. Um, and that because of the, the there's a, a risk of getting injured or sick overseas, which is not covered under Medicare, right. you need to have travel insurance. You know? And so then you're kind of moving into the liability waiver yeah. territory there, right? Oh, yeah. Which is, a, and, I guess, like, and I guess everyone should have one of them, particularly for any sort of, you know, guided expedition or, and it's just, the, again, a liability waiver is effectively a statement of fact saying you are going on this expedition, stuff can happen, mm-hmm. we will do our best to look after you, but ultimately your safety is your responsibility. Yeah, and I said, I felt because this has come up in particular. I think um, the island in New Zealand, the operator is being sued by some Americans, actually. Um, yeah, because they claim that they were not given sufficient um, warning of the risks that they were taking on when when going to the active volcano. Yeah, and that'll be an interesting thing in New Zealand because New Zealand's got that that government uh, legislated. Uh, level of, of indemnity for all operators in, in New Zealand where the liability is actually legislated and limited. I remember mm-hmm. years ago I went on a horse trekking expedition in New Zealand where the guy really didn't care whether I put a helmet on or not. And I said, well, what's the story if I fall off myself? He said, well, not my problem. We're in, you're in New Zealand now. You can't sue me or if you have a go at it, it will be met under that, that government scheme that's, that's there, which is you know, in some way, good thing, some way, bad thing. I think if you get injured in New Zealand without travel insurance or without your own sort of cover, chances of you getting a, a massive liability settlement are pretty slim, which so is quite different, quite different to most countries. In New Zealand? So, like, if I go and go on an expedition yep. in New Zealand, Absolutely. what if I'm traveling with a New Zealand company to another country? That I can't comment on. Okay. I think, yeah, so... Basically, look, anything, again, my general advice here, Australian broker. Um, Fair so enough. I, I Fair know where you're going. New, New Zealand, have a, it would be a very, it is a, a very different liability market in New Zealand. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, and I think, so actually that leads me into my question about um, domestic versus international. So a lot of uh, companies are sort of refocusing on domestic travel yeah. opportunities in, in sort of the near term. So um, is there, is that easier or really the same considerations as international, but at least, you know, you oh, look, I, I will, control? <laughs> yeah, look, I'd have to say as a, as a rule, it is easier by mere virtue that Australian residents on a whole are protected by Medicare. Mm-hmm. And that basically, as, as I understand it, is a, a level of global cover for Australians within the territory of Australia. So, and there is argument that that includes, you know, if you get caught on a hill, get lost in the book or the bush walk, you're hiking, whatever, then there is, you know, significant protections under Medicare for, for medical costs incurred, um, potentially ambulance, but that's a state by state arrangement yeah. and, and evacuation. Um, travel insurance can provide um, some cover in that case, but the travel insurance companies will also know, will also advise that they can only provide the cover where they're allowed to provide the cover. So some of the, the, the rules under Australian legislation is that travel insurers can't provide medical insurance for Australian residents traveling in Australia. Right. And, um, we've got um, some information here from Gina Cambridge from Wanderlust, who's on our call today. She's actually from New Zealand, everyone. And she right. was saying the ACC is their cover in New Zealand. Yeah. And they also pay if you have a traveler have an accident. They do, but I think it's under a schedule. It's a bit like work cover in Queensland or Australia. For workers' compensation, there's generally a mandated list of compensation amounts, um, which is a little bit a little bit different under my understanding as to what a, a liability in Australia might be where we buy liability covers for $10 million, $20 million cover. Yeah. Um, and so, so in the domestic yeah. market, I mean, I think, you know, depending on the country, so... Australia and New Zealand have have Medicare systems, and so um, residents traveling within those yeah. countries are covered in terms of if they get COVID while in their own countries, then then it's a yeah, presumably that, reciprocal arrangement. Yeah, and so and then um, but then there's kind of the next level of travel insurance, which is for for example, you know, I've I've booked in for a trip to the ski fields in Victoria. Yeah. Um, 
So, you know, I didn't buy travel insurance for that, but let's say I, I had, um, that probably wouldn't be covered under, um, like, because of all the exclusions that are being written well, out. It, dep so, well, it depends what happens, right? So travel insurance is not just about medical costs as a rule. So tra tra that's certainly medical costs is a big part of it. The other big part of travel insurance is cancellation costs. Mm -hmm. So if something happens to you or a close family member that prevents you going on your journey and you lose your deposits, Mm -hmm. then that's a big that's a big part of claims um so yeah. we're dealing with hundreds of those claims at the moment under a policy we wrote which um fortunately didn't have a pandemic exclusion on it mm -hmm. so so yeah. basically when dfat 4 happened our policy is kicking in for a particular for a, for a group of people um but so travel insurance traditionally within a domestic um setting is cancellation is a big deal so if you're paying big deposits on stuff then Travel insurance is what you need to protect you. If something happens that you can't go on the journey, you don't get your money back. It also generally covers your, your luggage that's traveling with you. Yeah. Uh, it was generally the big saving sometimes is in a higher car excess reduction. So mm -hmm. if I was to travel to Perth, for example, and hire a car and travel around for two weeks, traditionally I would have, a, it might cost me $50 a day, but with a $5,000 excess. And the, the higher companies traditionally say, well, that's fine. For an extra $20 a day, you can reduce your excess to $1,000, for example. Right. Now, if you have a travel insurance policy in place, they will meet that excess. So even if it's five grand, they'll pay that excess. So you don't need to, to wear the extra cost for higher car costs. Mm -hmm. And that could be, you know, that's a, if you're hiring a car for 20 days or 30 days, it's it could be a significant amount of money. So there is, we, we see a lot of claims in that regard. Um, so um, with regards to the sort of um, the refund kind of, or the sort of mm -hmm. refundable thing. So a lot of travel deposits are, are sort of, um, you know, uh, the terms are non-refundable, right? Like yeah. Of our clients, yeah. I know Absolutely. Refundable policy. Um, but then there's some government things that are coming out in terms of having to refund or give credits. So I just wanted to get a sense from you in terms of if a business is kind of you know, ignoring the ones that, you know, yeah. they are what they are, right? Uh, people are working through those, but kind of starting from here, um, should businesses uh, be able to count on the fact that if they have a no refund policy on deposits, they can sort of um, have confidence that, that, that they can hold firm on those or should they change anything about their policies? Um, I think it's a difficult question. I don't think there's anything that's come through. I can certainly talk from a little bit on a financial services point of view where some of those travel insurance policies were being questioned about refund policies or not. Because traditionally a travel insurance policy gives you a 14 day cooling off period. Mm -hmm. But outside of that period, you've accepted that you've got travel insurance right up to the date that you complete your journey. Um, and from that period, then effectively you can make a claim any time. Now COVID sort of is, is, is becoming a, an issue in that regard for many of those policies that had a pandemic exclusion on them, for example, um, obviously you can't travel anymore, but those policies are, were also not going to pay for a cancellation claim either. Mm -hmm. Now that made it a little bit, that's a difficult situation for a provider of that travel insurance policy in respect to maintaining a stance on refunds. Um, if you had a policy that provided cover, then I think it's a different story. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there also needs to be some sort of an understanding generally that when a business provides something to you, it's not normally without expense, labor, time, whatever. So I personally have a view that to argue for a hundred percent refund probably just doesn't allow for the fact that there's already been a cost of production mm -hmm. anyway, and that there obviously may well be argument for a proportionate refund or for some sort of refund, but I, I certainly don't believe that it's it's fair for a business who's provided work to not be compensated for that at least proportionally i think yeah. it's my my most diplomatic way of, of saying how it's done and i think that's going to be company to company mm -hmm. um well because look even the tour operator does a huge amount of work just to get the, the tour happening you know you could spend you know 10 20 30 50 100 hours with a time and for no fault of your own the tour is not going ahead but now you're being placed in a position to say, we'll give back the money for work I've already done. I find that difficult. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure whether the government could legislate that or not. Certainly, I 
we have a, a different level of, of uh, arrangements in the financial services. There are recourse and, and dispute facilities where obviously there's negotiated settlements potentially, but for a small business owner, I'm not sure how that plays out. And so, uh, um, I think yeah. it's, most businesses would have to act commercially. Yeah. But I think I, I just wanted to kind of, um, yeah. make sure that, it, um, sort of thinking through like one of the, the one of the risks that's happening right now is that yeah. you have a situation where you're selling travel, you take a deposit, you've given that to your operator on the ground. Um, they can't give that back to you, but your client is, is sort of demanding a refund because of, um, COVID. and I guess it's just, I mean, I think my sense of this is especially going forward because now everybody knows, yeah. that, right. Yeah. Um, like just making sure that your, your terms and conditions are really clear, which is that, look, we're all taking a risk here. Um, we all know that things are a bit uncertain. If you choose to pay this deposit, it is non-refundable. Um, uh, and then I guess adding on to that, like whether or not there's a credit policy. So like, maybe yeah, that's right. Deposit, like in the yeah. Look, I don't think there's any greater advice to say that each business is will, will operate on its own merit and its own doctrine and how they deal with, with customers. Um, ultimately, in many cases, it sounds like it's a commercial decision um, to refund money or not. And that becomes, you know, I think that it's business specific. Mm -hmm. um, I think the concept of credit is probably fair or well, they're probably one of the fairer outcomes you can do, particularly there's no money coming back. Yeah. Um, and I guess sometimes when dealing with customers, it's like, well, yes, you're out of pocket too, but and so am I. So, and unfortunately we're working together here and COVID-19 is a force majeure event. This is outside the, the scope of understanding for all of us. And if you didn't, if your travel insurance didn't provide the cover, then unfortunately that's unfortunate. Yeah. And, and, and that's going to be the reality going forward is that it won't be covered. Um, you know, COVID related issues will not be covered under any new policies that are issued. So I think World Nomads started writing policies um, uh, in the last week or so. Um, so, you know, starting to yeah. see um, that, is, that is coming back, obviously not for, um, um, uh, that is coming back in, but of course there's going to be exclusions in those I'm guessing. So one of the things that, um, um, actually, Aaron uh, wanted to have a comment there. Jeff, can you un unmute him? Because I think this is uh, some advice that we got from Aaron about, um, did you find him in the list, Jeff? Aaron Fish? I can see Aaron on the bottom corner of mine. Yeah, he's, he's working, moving around. <laughs> but we just can't there hear him. There we go, he's <laughs> unmuted. Do you guys mind if I chime in on something? Yeah, yeah. Really cool. I appreciate it. And this is really uh, educational for me um, because I'm, I'm based in, in the States, in the United yeah. States, and, and travel insurance has some, some, some different laws here, <laughs> even depending on which state the yeah. traveler lives in. Um, you know, the, the issue of um, what's going to be covered moving forward it's a lot about how what Sean alluded to a few minutes ago with um, travel insurance can cover many different things. And when it comes to the medical aspects of coverage, as far as I know, even in all carriers in, in, uh, in the United States and, and outside, they are, I'm sorry, most carriers are still applying coverage, medical coverage or treatment for COVID. So if you actually come down and 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 are traveling and for, yeah. forbid you actually do contract COVID, then you there's a high likelihood you could still have coverage for the treatment that you seek and receive. Unless, and this is a the big caveat, and Sean, I'm curious to get your feedback on this. Um, and by the way, uh, the I am a, a travel insurance agent. That's yeah. That, yeah. That, that's <laughs> Um, I, 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 and I'm also a traveler, so I'm, I'm a consumer of it, but I'm curious to, to get your feedback on this. The, the issue that we're finding is if you do not buy your travel insurance in a timely fashion, because uh, the pre-existing condition coverage can be based on the timing of your purchase relative to the timing of your initial trip payment. Yes. Of any time. 
So if you do not have pre-existing condition coverage on your policy, and for some reason, hopefully not, but if you did have COVID previously and then contracted it again yeah. on travel, could not have coverage, even though you think that you, you might yeah. have coverage. So it's actually quite complicated and, and convoluted, you know, and at the same time, we've had some insurance carriers say it doesn't even matter. If you travel and you're away and you contract COVID and you need care, we will take care of you, where some carriers just won't do that. And you're yeah. not going to find that on the summary of benefits. No, it's a, look, the, and in Australia, it's, it's, it's becoming much, much harder to get that cover. Um, traditionally in Australia, the, we sell corporate travel insurance for businesses and we sell leisure travel, uh, travel insurance for, for, for private travelers. Um, as a rule, the corporate policies were much broader in their cover and much more generous and relaxed in regards to pre-existing conditions cover. Mm -hmm. um, and they were the, the best policies you could buy. And traditionally, they are designed for business trips, but they also generally extended to cover up the, the directors and the, the C-class employees, the officers, et cetera, for their leisure trips, including the family. Um, the leisure providers only were significantly stricter on cover for pre-existing conditions or particularly undeclared pre-existing conditions. Um, and they seem to be also probably the front runner when it comes to pandemic exclusions, et cetera. Um, I am now seeing strongly that the, even the corporate travel providers now, are, I know one large one has written out COVID entirely. Um, like I said at the beginning there, the one that we have as a group or even my business has written it out entirely, which is a, an issue. Um, I know of three carriers that are, that are covering it for business purposes, but will exclude it for private, if it's a pure leisure uh, cover. Um, and I think we're waiting on advice from some London providers as to what their position is going to be going forward for COVID. So Australia sounds to be, in many respects, even a little bit more restricted than America at the moment in relation to COVID co, which I think is going to be a fundamental issue down the track. Now, Australia is still in lockdown, right? So we, we, we have an issue moving anywhere because we're, um, the government has declared that the, the, the world effectively, uh, without unless you've got exemption, is off limits. Um, but it is going to be, I think, one of the, the biggest topics in travel insurance in Australia for the next six months as to what level of cover you can and can't buy for COVID particularly. Mm -hmm. But I'd also suspect that they may be revisiting pre-existing conditions cover as well. So, uh, so, um, so maybe we can kind of understand a fact sheet or something to a, a, a that you, that, yeah. Sorry, Sean, I think we're having some, some technical difficulties. Um, can you still hear us? David, can you help? I can hear you. I can't. You're sort of frozen. I can hear you. I can't. You're frozen. Um, maybe try shutting off your Is video for a second. <laughs> to reduce your bandwidth. Yeah, I'll try mine. Okay. Let's see if I'll that. Try that. And can you see me now? Uh, still a little bit. Uh... You're still frozen. Oh, maybe this is a little bit better. Uh, no, he's still frozen. Uh, the joys of, of, uh, of too many people on Zoom, right? I'm here, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Is that any better? Yeah, let's let's give that a try. All right. Yeah, you seem to be back. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the questions then becomes like, if uh, as a travel business trying to support your travelers to get the right level of insurance, yeah. how can they help their clients know that they are getting as yeah. much coverage as they can? So, like, how do you ask? Um, okay, it says no coverage for pandemics, but is that no cancellation coverage or yeah. is that like no Absolutely. medical, no cancellation, everything? Look, I, I think ultimately that there may be the opportunity for collectives to, to seek to find a, 
uh, an insurance carrier, carrier through an intermediary or a broker, or whoever it might be, to try and buy a you know, almost a bulk purchase of insurance cover that may well be um, more generous in coverage than if the individual is buying it themselves. Okay. Um, I think that, and as a rule, you can do that in many insurance products, so I can't see why necessarily the travel insurance market would be much different. Um, I think the only limiting factor at the moment is the level of uncertainty and, and availability of underwriting access to the, as I said, COVID has, has caused a huge issue in administration and processing across Australia and in many parts of the world, including London, just trying to get things done. Um, but I think ultimately I would, even for our clients, I'd be actively seeking some sort of insurance arrangement that, it, that gives as best cover as possible, including cover for, you know, if it's, if it's COVID or COVID related for, a, for the cohort that I'm looking after. So you, so you sort of recommend to your travel business clients that they would um, find a, a travel insurance company that would give them the policy that, you know, for their groups that they would sort of say, like, I'll bring you 20 customers. These are the things that I want in that, um, in that coverage. Um, and, and basically, yeah, and you negotiate or just ask for what they can give you. You'd, you'd, you'd probably need to go to an intermediary to get it done. Okay. Um, to a, a a broker generally would have maybe have access to five or six or seven or eight different travel insurance providers. Um, and most of those travel insurance companies will generally deal with intermediaries on a, on a, on a scale rather than a one-to-one -one yeah. arrangement. Um, but it, look, it, it's, it's clear as obviously the first point of calls when you are having a guest come traveling with you that, you give them, there's a fact sheet to say, hey, you, you need to buy travel insurance to cover these risks. By the way, there might be risks if they're not covered. You can, uh, if you sort out whatever cover you can sort out. But here's, here's also a the, the indemnity or the, the acceptance document you're going to sign to come traveling with me, accepting certain risks, et cetera. So, so absolutely, like I guess. So if you do the favor to yourself and to your clients of kind of getting a sort of recommended um, package, you then need to make it really clear, like, look, this is, you know, our best effort, but here's the liability that says, you know, this insurance policy only covers these things. That's right. It doesn't yeah. cover, yeah. And normally I would expect that your intermediary or broker would take that responsibility on to provide through the advice through you as the, the organiser, because I don't think there's any expectation that as an organiser, you should be giving policy advice saying, will you cover for this, this or not? I think you you should be able to work with your your intermediary to, to work you through that process. And mm -hmm. generally, you've, you've, with the intermediary, with the insurance company, we'll probably produce a fact sheet for you. And, and, that, and, that and really the, clients, the client, would, <laughs> and then I would also suggest the client would then you try and have the transaction done with your client to the broker rather than through you, if that was possible. Right. So you're not actually selling the insurance. You're just referring. You're your referring client. it and you're facilitating yeah. it. But they said ultimately the discussion, mm -hmm. the negotiation goes on. Yeah. And because you never know that because generally some travel insurance, particularly pre-existing medical conditions might be considered a, you know, with some level of confidentiality or privacy. Right. Yeah. Et cetera. Gina, uh, sorry, Karen was asking, <clears throat> how much is the level of cover related to the price? Um, certainly relates to price. It's like any, it's the insurance, like anything, it's apples for apples. If you buy something cheap, it's generally cheap. Insurance companies make stuff cheap by excluding things. Yep. None of no, none are stupid. So that's exactly what they what you do. I think it is a. depending on how well insurance goes, obviously you start negotiating levels of cover and, and within some certain scope, you can tailor policies to individuals. But um, I would think there might be a few basics that would need to be, to be covered off. Um, as I said, medical when you're overseas is the main, the big one. Um, cancellation is the one after that. And then Luggage and other bits and pieces, well, okay, that can either be accepted or not accepted by the traveller. 
So uh, how about things like, um, so pre-existing conditions obviously being a really important one yeah. for a lot of people. Um, do you think that that's going to be a kind of a blanket, like for a given policy, um, there's this extra cost because it covers pre-existing conditions. Do you think there will be an, another level of cost of like, well, if you're over 50? And yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they already do that now. So depending on, so travel insurance is generally based on how long you, where you're going, how long you're going for, how old are you, mm -hmm. and potentially what you're doing. So if you're going to base camp or you're going hiking over 3,000 metres or you're doing uh, a, motor, you know, a, a motorcycle journey somewhere or whatever that's considered or hazardous, obviously the price changes depending on what you're doing in that regard. Um, but as, as I said, I think you can buy basic travel insurance will cover you and might, might be perfectly fine for a young, fit person with no medical history. But if once you're in, you know, plus 50, plus 55, plus 60, and you might have had life experience, you may have some medical conditions, then obviously becomes a, a choice as to whether you buy it or not. And certain policies, certainly ones that we've, we've worked with in the past, have given our clients the choice to cover certain pre-existing medical conditions or not at an extra charge. Ah, so actually splitting that out even further. Can, yeah, there, are systems, there, are systems, there are systems that will do that stuff. Okay. Um, and look, it, who knows, it might come to the point where underwriters may well price, for example, COVID-19. They might say, okay, if you want COVID-19 cover for 50 grand, it's going to be this much. For 100 grand, it's this much. For 500 grand, it might be this much. Maybe. I'm pretty sure there's going to be some, some smart insurance people and uh, actuaries trying to work out whether they can price it that way. Because so I think it's in the travel insurance industry's best interest to do it. Yeah, I think sure. I, I'm fearful that in the absence of doing that, then all of us are going to be a little bit hesitant in traveling, and no one wants that. Yeah, so, and I think the insurance company that figures that one out is going to make a fortune, right? Well, <laughs> assuming they can with, get the numbers know. right. <laughs> yeah. So Karen, um, Karen had another good question, and mm. I'd like to ask this question too because it, it often comes up. Um, what about insurance offered by banks or credit card companies? Um, clients seem to love them but yep. are sufficient? Uh, mm, okay, so depending on the client, um, they can be fine, um, but generally where they fall down is if you, the type of journey you undertake is outside the norm. If you're over a certain age, um, certainly if you have pre-existing medical conditions, then they routinely fall down. Um, we've done a lot of work in comparison credit card policies versus corporate policies versus a, a group policy. Um, I think the, you, you, Karen's absolutely right. Most people go, I've got credit card insurance, it's all good. I hazard a guess like most of us, I don't know how many people would have read the policy or even know where it was. <laughs> Karen has. <laughs> Karen has. So the, we, 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 do, we, we used to uh, deal with a, a lot of um, sort of over 55s, up to age 90, um, we, we, we looked after. And most of those policies will stop once you're 74 or 75 anyway. Can you, um, yeah. can you, can you share that um, comparison, Sean, or the main points? Because I think everyone on the call would probably like to... I can, I can dig out what, what we've got on that and I can certainly send it through to Jen to say, okay, look, it's, here's some basic information that we found um, in regards to the credit cards, because there is a buyer beware. Yeah, and I'm sure it very much depends on the credit card. Um, we need more people like Karen actually reading them. <laughs> That's right. And look, I, I don't know where the credit card insurance will go after in the new world because that might be a bigger issue. Because mm. uh, I know that the credit card policies, the vast majority in Australia exclude a pandemic. Right. It's not all. And some insurance companies were backing a credit card policy and some would have their own insurance policies and they were different. So, um, so just to kind of move on no. to some more questions, uh, I, one of the things I, I was sort of thinking about is, you know, people have some downtime, so they might be just bored and wanting to rewrite the terms and conditions. Uh, mm. So, you know, do you think that people should really extensively rethink their terms and conditions post COVID? Or do you think it's really just like, you need to add a section about COVID? Uh, look, look, I think, 
you know, look, I think, look, the COVID is a section, right? But it doesn't necessarily, it's, COVID is terrible and awful. I don't know it's, if it's the be all and end all, potentially. I think that the, the genuine hope for, for many of us, if you're younger, you're not in a high risk category, is that if, if, if um, we, you're exposed to it, then the chances of being very seriously ill is, is less. Mm-hmm. And maybe that will change your travel decision. Um, but I would think as a business, it is now, it's probably naive to ignore your responsibilities as a business. I think the best you can do is provide a level of, of factual based advice to your, your clients. I think it's part of your risk management profile. You should absolutely be looking through, okay, it's a, well, insurance is about the what ifs, right? Most of us buy insurance and never want to use it. Touch wood. So, but it is the only reason you're buying is that if something happens, then it will it could go badly pear shaped. And if you're self employed, like including me, I don't want to lose my job because of something that, that's happened during my job. And I think most tour guides operators are it's exactly the same boat. So, the best we can you can do is obviously you want to you know some sort of insert about COVID. I think it's obvious now. Um, but I don't think that necessarily releases you for the, re- the responsibility of making sure that your, your rescue document is good mm-hmm. and that you, you can show that you've made a reasonable level of investigation um, into what could happen and you're providing some fair um, advice to your, the people that are going to travel with you saying, here's the do's and don'ts. You can explain why, you know. So speaking of Jen, I did the Kokoda walk four years ago and I had to get a full medical and a bunch of stuff before I went, which was absolutely, I would think, normal for the tour operator to ask for it. So, again, I think generally I try and put myself into the shoes of the person that's buying the product and say, so what would you expect? You know, and if you read a document that said here, here, and here, and something bad happened, then you don't want, you know, it's, it's a big call for them to say, I didn't read it. Well, you say, well, you read it and you signed it. We talked about it. You know, it's, you can't stop someone having a go at you or suing you. Um, but you can at least have something in, in place to give you some sort of defence and say, hey, look, I've done the right thing. And so it's, a, it's really about making sure you've, you've reviewed your risk management um, plans just generally mm. to make sure <clears throat> that it covers the case of a pandemic in more detail given the higher risk of, of running into that now, right? Absolutely. And it may, look, it may well come down to the countries you're travelling to. Like, I think we're in a bit of a no-man's land for, you know, the US is, is handling it differently to, to Europe, just handling it different to, to Australia and Australasia. You know, touch we, we, we're lucky, but in, all, in some respects, it's going to make it maybe a different decision for us to travel abroad. Um, yeah. And we may well be constrained by government or insurance or another number of things. And I say, if you're a tour operator proposing to do a journey to a country that has, um, you know, COVID, for example, a pandemic outbreak in that country, then you're going to have to be a little bit more mindful of the saying, well, there is a real risk when that mm-hmm. comes back in. So you'd want the participants to, least to sign up and accept that risk. And so it's about, you know, making sure that your terms and conditions cover you in terms of clarification around non-refundable deposits, if you're offering credits, things like that. Yeah. If you're requiring insurance, making sure that's in your terms and conditions, making sure your plan is well thought out and that you uh, you've got a liability waiver that clearly indicates like these are That's what right. we're going to do, but you have to understand you're still taking on risk. So having them sign that. And then the next piece is I've just recently started to see COVID questionnaires coming up on, on trips that, that clients yeah. are so asking, have you been tested? Have you been exposed? Where have you been in the last two weeks? So do you think that that's the kind of thing that um, insurance companies will expect you to do or is that something that travel businesses should just do to protect themselves look i would work on the presumption that obviously we we know that the there's a heightened risk of of, of a of a trouble happening you know if you got a you got a, a guest that got sick in a journey with you you know and just say it is covid for whatever reason right but then they get seriously ill then obviously that's a, a difficult position for you because you're going to be doing the right thing by the client um but prior to all that, I guess it'd probably be in your, your interest to, you know, as much as it's going to get a full medical, a full medical may now involve 
getting a COVID test, mm. you know? And then you as a, as a tour operator can say in good faith to the other participants of the tour that all of you have been tested yeah. 14 days prior or whatever period it is, I'm not sure. It's, it's sort of almost normal now, weirdly, mm. to have a test. And that, that may be, a, again, a reasonable operating decision on you to make sure that not you are trying to protect the collective who's coming with you. You know, and if yeah. it's get a stress test, get a medical, get a stuff to do it. By the way, you need to get a, a COVID clearance. That might be the norm. So kind of like I've had to, you know, get a yellow fever vaccine to go to um, yeah, absolutely. South America. Yeah. 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 We are, and we all are quite happy to do that. If we travel to South America or PNG or wherever, we're quite happy to get, or, or Africa, we're quite happy to go to the doctor and get the shots, right? Yeah. So I'm not sure what the would there be any great resistance to say, well, you need to get a, you know, a COVID test. Mm. And maybe it costs you a hundred bucks or whatever, so be it. Yeah. Uh, Ben's asking to, to yeah. speak there, Jeff, if you can unmute him. And um, so just one thing on that then, obviously there is a lead time with COVID. There's this 14 day window that we think we're clear at at the end of it. So that test, you know, has that got to be conducted within 48 hours of departing for the trip? I mean, there's that, that's one of those things yeah. that we're just not going to know these things. I, I don't think there's any, I don't think there's an answer for that. I think the only thing you can do is saying you've been reasonable in, in, in discharging your duty of care by asking someone to get a test within the window. Yeah. I don't, I don't think it's going to, there's no way it's going to provide a 100% shield against anything. And we all know that, right? Yeah. Yeah. The best you can do is that you at least have been cognizant of it and you've tried to, you've made reasonable efforts to have people tested, right? Yeah, point I mean, taken. Point yeah. taken. It's a tick in our list of due diligence. The tick in the list of due diligence. And the one point I will make is that even with the waivers, the indemnity waivers, it's going to be wise as much as it's a, it's a hassle and a pain is that some of this stuff is putting you into legal advice land where it would be very wise to have a legal professional look over or assist or even draft your waiver after a consultation with you. And it might, you know, it's going to cost some money, but it would be money well spent. Yeah. Um, we're getting a question from Aaron, actually, whether or not any Australian travel insurance carriers are still planning on offering cancel for any reason upgrade benefits. For uh, not that I'm, the answer is no, I haven't heard of it. And even the one that did offer it, only offered it for a short period of time. I understand it cost a fair bit of money. It got taken off pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, so, look, I, don't, I, don't, I think it's, it, it was a nice marketing thing. The cancellation for any reason was also limited in how much it paid out. It wasn't a blanket cover. Right. So cancel for any reason, but only up to a certain amount of money. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, no, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon, if ever again. Yeah. Um, so I have an interesting one just from talking to some of our clients who, uh, you know, sort of have done a lot of group travel, but are now looking at in the meantime, actually doing travel advice. So rather than actually escorting groups, um, instead kind of, yeah. pivoting to kind of doing selling travel advice services. So they yeah. wouldn't actually sell the hotel rooms or the, no. you know, so they just, they would just be selling their, their, advice. Uh, their expertise. Yeah. So can you talk through the kind of different liability yeah. between those two modes of selling the travel versus selling the advice? Okay, so, so in the simplest terms, public liability insurance is about someone getting injured as a direct consequence of your business activity, directly, right? Or even, or, or damaging property. Um, when you give advice to someone and then they rely on that advice down the track and that causes them injury, and generally it's financial injury, then that's, in Australia, it's called professional indemnity insurance. It's advice, it's insurance I have that covers m most of me. It's unlikely I'm going to cause someone to hurt themselves or they're going to fall over in my office and hurt themselves. But if I give bad insurance advice, then I have to have insurance to cover that advice. So it's called, the, the, the terminology is called professional indemnity insurance. And you can buy it, travel agents can buy it, real estate agents buy it, um, et cetera. So that's if you're going to pivot to become an advice provider, then again, you'd be conscious about how you provide your advice, what sort of caveats you put to it. Um, is it based purely on fact or is it going to be personal experience and personal recommendation? Um, are you going to facilitate something? Um, and ultimately, I guess if something bad happens because of it, someone sues you for it, 
then generally it's going to be you know, a for some sort of financial loss. And again, professional identity insurance is the one you need to have in place to cover it. Now, like with all insurances, you'll have to be mindful of exclusions and restrictions and whatever that might be. So it's not really it's not really reducing any of your liability per se. Although I suppose um, it's it a different mean, liability. Sorry. It's a just it's a different liability. Yeah. So it's just shifting it to a different kind. Yeah. That's right. And I think it would come down to how you draft your advice and what sort of advice it is. Because remember, the ultimately we we insurance is about what the the courts would determine as to who's at fault or not, and if you're at fault, how much you should pay. So if you were to provide advice that is purely factual and it was written in a way to say, hey, here's some traveller's tips, which are pretty generic, then it'd be a, a tough call to be sued on generic advice that you could buy through the internet in 400 different places. Mm. It's when you start getting into a bit more personal advice, okay, taking into account your age, your, your, your physical condition, your hopes and dreams, your budget, etc., and you start giving advice when it's more tailored is where that exposure goes up. And particularly if you charge for that advice, you soon, as soon as you charge for it, you have an exposure. Yeah. So um, on that point, actually, in terms of being, being sued versus let's say something happens and you just sort of, you feel like um, the right thing to do is to refund the money for some reason mm -hmm. or to cover something. Uh, does does the client have to sue for the insurance to cover, or can the company decide to accept? No, that? the client the client the client has to sue or threaten to threaten to sue, basically. So um, if you if you decide to be a good you know build your reputation and give money for yeah the issue, that, that's a that's a business risk and we all take that that's a that's a cost of doing business. Mm -hmm. Insurance pays for many things, but it doesn't cover the cost of in many areas doing business. You know, it's called it's called commercial risk. Yeah. Okay. So then, so then, you know, it's, it, when you're thinking about how much um, insurance that you need and, and how mm. to manage your risk, it's also sort of understanding like what are the risks that somebody is going to sue you, um, right? In, in terms of like. Absolutely. Look. Yeah. And in look, in Australia, generally, public liability is mandated at limits. It's generally bought in five, ten million dollars, twenty million dollars. If you had something extraordinary, you know, over twenty million dollars, but generally you're talking about big corporations. Mm. Um, if it was to do with your advice, your professional advice, for example, you know, trying to arrange a trip for someone, then it, it comes down to more, you might buy a million dollars cover or 500 grand or 2 million because the chances of a financial loss claim for that amount of money are less than someone being disastrously injured or crippled or heaven forbid, something like that, which is where those claims for lots of money come from. Or you have a group of people who all heaven forbid, get injured at the same time, which is why you buy $10 million or $20 million. Right, yeah. Yeah, so that's, as a rule of thumb, you buy as much as you can afford and you make sure you spend some money in, in addressing the, the, the known risks, you know. Yeah. I don't think anyone, I don't think all, any of us can be naive anymore about what happens. Fair enough. Um, and then you have a good lawyer to say, what happens if, if something really terrible happens and like my insurance doesn't pay, have I set my business structure up well enough? Right, to protect myself. Yeah, it, well, what, if you can. Yeah. Well, so um, one more interesting question that I got in from one of the registrations was about cyber insurance. Yep. Um, yep. And I think maybe, maybe it's just because we're all online all the time now. If that was something that you didn't have before as a business, is this a good time to be thinking about getting it? Uh, the answer is yes. Yes, um, I've done, we've done a bit of work in that. I've got a website called cyberattackcover.com.au, I think, mm -hmm. that basically cyber insurance is the, the new vanguard of risk um, because we have so much data online now and we're so beholden to it that if someone gets in, um, we've had experiences a number of years ago, uh, to a server and they lock your server down and lock your data down, it is a huge disruption. Um, now we all rely on backups and how it's all done correctly. If it doesn't work or your backups don't come back or whatever, then you are facing down the, the directly to say, I'm gonna pay the ransom and hope I get my money back or my data back. And that, that happens unfortunately routinely, 
and those ransoms are generally ten thousand dollars plus um, or you hope to rebuild your data from your emails that you might still have a lot of its pieces um, the 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 other exposure you have now is that if you have any information on a person that's identifiable and could be considered as private you potentially at law in Australia can be sued for it mm -hmm. All right, so that is a, it's another liability. It's called cyber liability. Um, further, if you're a, a bigger corporation or you're in the medical field or, or legal field or finance, then you also have a responsibility to government to, to report yourself under mandatory data breach reporting. And if you don't do it or you're found to not do the right thing, you can be fined by the government as well. So it's all bad news. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and, and our platform, like we're data stewards. So yeah. Our responsibility is to to protect our clients' data, yeah. um, you know, to the to the degree that we can in terms yeah, of yeah. reasonable, um, you know, sort of encryption and security practices and all that kind of stuff. So, if anybody is interested in that, in all the gory details of that, yeah. please let us know and we can send you some more information on that. But yeah, it's a, the the company has the direct responsibility in terms of protecting the the. Absolutely. Data, and then they pass that through to us as their data steward to ensure um, that we are doing our best effort and using the best practices to to support them in that. That's right. Absolutely. So, look, the 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 upside is is there is now readily available cyber insurance. Um, the policies are different. There's multiple variations around with different insurance companies around. Fundamentally, you're looking to buy a product that covers the costs of fixing your data. Uh, investigating, investigating what happened, um, using the insurance company's investigators and potentially your your IT department or provider or consultant, whoever. Um, if need be, the policies will pay for the ransom if there's no nothing else that can be done. Um, and then the the next part of the policies are if you happen to get sued because of the breach, then they'll pay that as well. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of there's sort of three sections to a, a cyber policy. Um, but it's a whole it's a whole new field that's out there now but generally speaking for small business it's not necessarily horribly expensive to um, buy some to, to buy that 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 cover i think it's going to become more the norm it's a bit like buying you know in the day business interruption cover or theft cover yeah. or lots of other bits and pieces so it just becomes part of the the business part of what you buy it's, it's on, that's right um Businesses also buy, if you've got you and a couple of staff, then potentially you need, you need to buy management liability cover as well, yeah. which covers you as the business owner against risks from running a business that are outside of you, what you do as a you know, uh, tour operator, expedition guide, et cetera. So yeah. I guess fundamentally, like insurance, like, like what you do is pretty complex at times. Um, if you can find a good intermediary, they'll walk through all of it with you and at least give you good counsel and as a business you've ultimately got a decision as to what you buy you don't buy how much what the budget does etc we all face that all the time so uh just to kind of wrap up here in terms of you know kind of what i've heard from all of this is this is a time when we should be you know reassessing our policies and making sure that we've you know a address the changing circumstances because things yeah. have changed um, and just like before because there were risks before and we mitigated them and we had liability waivers before so it's just about making sure that those are now updated that might be updated yeah right um, and if that's not something that um, that people are comfortable with on their own then that would be they would be seeking um, seeking advice from insurance brokers or legal advisors yeah on that stuff um, potentially adding cyber insurance to their to their list. Well, um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And look, at the very least, the, the the one thing I'll take away, and I've had dealt with it, a number of claims for some businesses, big ones. I think one claim was about a hundred thousand um, dollars. Is you know, the takeaway is make sure your backup is done very regularly, daily at least, daily, and make sure it's somewhere not in your not on your server. We do regular backups, by the way, everybody. Yep. <laughs> but that's the only way around some of most of cyber attacks, the only way to get to actually to to defeat it is to have a backup that is not linked to your computer network. Absolutely. Um, but then, you know, just sort of recognizing it's a changing landscape. So I think um, 
the, that's why sort of spending this time to kind of revisit your policies, right? Because no matter what insurance you can buy, there's always going to be some stuff that the insurance doesn't cover and you'll want to make sure Absolutely. you have, have processes in place to communicate effectively to your customers uh, that there are risks when buying travel and traveling with you and, and just getting comfortable articulating that I think is yeah, probably yeah. some good practice to get into and um, just making sure that you feel like whatever you went through last time, your terms and conditions, you've revised them as needed based on your experiences going through that, that wave of lockdowns to make sure that they're gonna serve your business and your customers. Um, given that, you know, now people are gonna be aware of this and they, they're going to be asking you these questions. So being ready and saying, look, this, these are our risk, this is our risk management policy. We've recently updated it. These are, these are the requirements, like if you've decided you're gonna require that they get tested before they travel with you, <clears throat> you'll have that in your policies and you'll just, that'll make them feel more comfortable buying from you, I'm guessing. Um, but that's not something, uh, there's no like checklist, like you have to do yeah. things. It's more like you have to figure out what's gonna be right for your business and your customers and then go get proper legal and insurance advice to kind of make that nice and tidy, right? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I think, look, we're all you know, small, medium enterprises. It's, it's part of doing business. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, if I can add Thanks. something to that, you know, I think there is something that could be on the checklist in general mm -hmm. and for anyone and around the world. Doesn't, like, doesn't, matter, doesn't matter where. The earlier, if you're looking for trip protection insurance, um, the earlier you purchase it, the more coverage you're going to have. Yeah. There, there's a lot of time sensitive benefits within your insurance plan. And, and a random person is not necessarily going to know that you should. I mean, it, it shouldn't be a bunch of hidden confusing yeah. <laughs> items, but um, that's why, you know, it's, I'm, I'm really grateful that Jenna and Jeff, that you guys have these, these um, informational events because People come away from it usually saying, wow, you know, like I learned so much that I, I, I wish I didn't have to learn. Like I wish it was there, you know, and, and that it was really um, mm -hmm. transparent. And that's why, you know, on, on um, January 30th, even we put just in, in, the, in the issue of transparency and we put on our purchasing, our quoting pathway, by the way, none of these plans are going to cover cancellation for COVID anymore. It was just telling people no. right away, like, Hey, you're not going to be covered for what you think you're going to be covered for. Yes. And people were writing emails to us saying, thank you so much for letting me know that. Cause I almost bought a policy, you know, and like, well, it's not going to cover you on any other. Yeah, uh, that's right. Policy either. <laughs> yeah. And, and another thing is, you know, so you can insure yourself, not self actual insurance, but yeah. Self insure. You know how, we were all, we, Jeff, I mean, Sean, you were talking about, uh, about uh, how we're all in this together and we all are. So if you, uh, some of you guys are travel planners, right? You have customers, you have traveling clients. If you can find a way to renegotiate your contracts with your suppliers and recognize that, hey, we're all in this together. I might have a cancellation last minute, but we want to keep doing work together. So can you re make sure that we're refunded if we have to cancel a trip? And the same thing will go the other way around too. You know, it's, it's, a, it's about being flexible and working together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point in terms of, of making sure that your suppliers are, you know, that you're, you're, you're operating as a team, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you guys so much for joining. Um, if there were any questions that you've got that 